We want to take a look this morning at um, the prophets. We've been going through the scriptures beginning in Genesis, uh, creation, working our way towards the cross, focusing on how God has pointed towards the cross, pointed towards the gospel all throughout the scriptures. And we've just been taking some highlights. Coming to the end of the Old Testament, you hit a section of scripture that is uh, the prophets. That's what it's called. And it is just uh, the writings of one prophet after another after another. And they are uh, giving largely warning to the nation of Israel that is straying from God, but it's also pointing to the first coming of Jesus Christ and beyond that, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to spend some time this morning looking at uh, what the prophets have spoken, what that reveals to us of God's plan of salvation. So Heavenly Father, we just humble our hearts before you. Oh, how we thank you for the truths that we have been singing. Truths about your nature, your work, your love, your grace. God, you are an awesome God. And as we were singing, I was reminded that it's all about you. Lord, sometimes we put ourselves at the center and we think you should be all about our needs. But God, this is your world. It's your creation. We have been created for your glory. You are working out a plan. And we have the privilege of opting in or opting out. But Lord, it's not about us. It's about you. And oh, what an awesome privilege to be able to be part of your plan, to be included in your life, to experience your life living in us. What a joy. What a blessing. Oh God, deliver us from the lies that take our thoughts away. Deliver us from those things that burden us. I pray that you would lighten the load. Remind us, Lord, that you have invited us to come unto you when we are weak and heavy laden, and you will give us rest. You did not come to condemn us. You did not come to load us down that we might serve you, but you came to set us free and to serve, to give your life a ransom for many. Lord, I could just spend this hour ahead praising and thanking you for what you have done. But we pray that as we look into your word that you would open our eyes, that you would stir our hearts, that you would cause faith to arise, that you would change our lives. Lord God, deliver us from lies, deliver us from deception, Deliver us from those things that would rob us of what you came to give us. And Lord, may we be a body of believers that encourage one another, to build one another up. Cause us to recognize that you delight in your church, for we are your bride. Lord, for those of us who are, are married, remind us Remind us of that first love and remind us that that is just a glimpse of how you love us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you have done and what you are doing in our lives. Set us free from the enemy who seeks to rob us. Return to us, Lord. Restore to us that joy, the joy of our salvation. I ask this in Jesus' name. I pray for your anointing, for your empowering. 
for I am weak, but you are strong. God, we love you. And it's in the name of Jesus we ask these things confidently, with expectation and gladness. Lord, we can hardly wait to see what you have in store for us. Amen. Amen. I just pray that the Lord can use me to encourage the church. Uh, you are loved by God. You're incredibly special to him. And the enemy works in so many ways to uh, feed us lies, to tell us that's not so. And he works in so many ways to turn us against one another. We need to resist the devil. And align our thoughts with the word of God, the truth of God's word. Almost from the very beginning of human history, the Bible tells us that the first humans rebelled against God by choosing to believe Satan's lie rather than believing God's word. This choice to go against God's word is what is called sin, and the consequence of sin is death. And death is described as affecting us in at least three ways. The first way that death affects us or that sin affects us is causing death to our physical bodies. Um, because of sin, we will die physically. Because of sin, we are all aging. Sin causes death to our relationship with God, it causes separation from our relationship with God. Because of sin, we are cut off from him. Sin separates us forever in the future from the goodness of God from any of his creation, any of his goodness, any of his blessings. Sin separates us from that. And what a hopeless condition. All descendants of Adam become willing slaves, are born as slaves in bondage to a very powerful and oppressive foe called Satan. Every descendant of Adam has been born cut off from their connection to God. And their condition deteriorates with age. It gets worse as you get older. They are spiritually dead, physically dying, getting progressively worse with time, and yet they will never cease to exist. How can we be saved from that? How can we escape that downward, destructive spiral? Our very nature is from the beginning sinful. We are born sinners. And our sin is revolting, disgusting. It's a stench to God. He cannot tolerate sin in his presence, and he certainly cannot tolerate it in his home. Our God is a God of love. He is a merciful God, a gracious God. He is wrathful towards sin, but merciful. He has provided a Savior who is the only way of escape. But we must choose to embrace him, we must choose to receive his offer of salvation. There is one way back to the Father. There is one way of being set free from sin. There is one way of being rid of our sinful nature and receiving a new nature. Our time on this planet is short. Ask anyone who's nearing the end. 
It's short, but it's a testing time. We are given this margin, we are given this time, this short time as a trial, as a test, given the privilege of living in God's creation in which we are exposed to both his goodness and Satan's evil, the darkness, exposed to both good and evil. And during this short time of our life, we must choose for ourselves who we are going to trust, who we are going to follow. Our creator, or are we like Adam and Eve going to choose some other way, some other voice? This life on earth is short, and it's our only opportunity to call upon the Savior to save us. And he has provided just one way of salvation. When this life is over, we will continue to exist forever, either separated from God in a literal place called hell, which is simply the absence of any of God's goodness, or we will exist forever with God in a literal place called heaven, which is the very presence of God. And some of that existence will be here on this earth made new. Our future state, however, is entirely dependent upon how we in this life respond to our Savior. An important time critical time. The big question is, who is that one Savior? Who is the one who can save us? Every religion claims to offer the way of salvation. How do we know the truth? I read a little illustration. I'll just, I'll just read it to you. I thought it was insightful to what we're going to look at here this morning. You may have read spy stories. It goes something like this. A secret agent is supposed to meet with an unknown contact. The secret agent is told to go to a certain city, catch a specific bus to an outlying suburb, and upon arriving, take a seat in the public square at 3 p.m. directly across from the town hall clock. He would be met by a bearded man wearing a long gray coat carrying a red briefcase. This man would ask the agent for the time of day. The agent was to point at the town clock and then ask the man if he knew Dr. Kim. Then this man would give him a vital top secret message. What's with all the detail? It is meant to ensure that the secret agent found the right contact and to remove any chance that he might be tricked into contacting an imposter. God knew that deceivers would come to mankind, just as the serpent came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and deceived them. God knew that deceivers would come and falsely declare themselves to be the Savior, the promised deliverer, the way of salvation and to ensure that people would correctly recognize the true way of salvation, God had many different prophets write about the coming Savior over a span of hundreds of years. There are many specific prophecies related to the Savior in the Old Testament. Many of them are, are cloaked. Many of them aren't, aren't real obvious. Many of them are. Many specific prophecies in the Old Testament, in order to qualify as the Savior, the one, the only one who can save you, to qualify as the only one who can deliver us from our sin, the only one who can conquer Satan, the only one whose death will be accepted by God as a sacrifice, a substitute sacrifice for our sin, that one must perfectly fulfill all of the prophecies that God gave. And if he doesn't fulfill these prophecies, don't listen to him because he's not the one. There is only one who can save us from our sin. There is only one who can lead us back to God. There are many voices saying, I am the one, this is the way. But God has given us 
a message in his word. He's given us identification in his word of that one. The prophecies were made by many different prophets over a period of many hundreds of years, and they provide the kind of details that all combined could never be duplicated by a fake. The mathematical chances of anyone being able to correctly fulfill just 48 of the 300 prophecies is one in 10 to the power of 157. That is 157 zeros after the one. There is only one person in existence who could possibly fulfill all of these prophecies. And when you find that one, he is the one who can save you. He is the one who can set you free from your bondage to Satan. He is the one who can give you a new nature, and deliver you from your sin nature. He is the one who can lead you to the Father. Many say that you must belong to the Roman Catholic Church to be saved. As we go through the prophecies, you decide if the Roman Catholic Church qualifies to be able to save us from our sin. Many say that you must be a Muslim, a follower of Muhammad, in order to be saved. But as we go through the prophecies given by the prophets of the Creator, you decide if Islam meets the requirements to be able to save us from our sin. Many say that only Judaism and keeping the law can save you from your sin. Many say that you must be a Mormon or a Buddhist or just a really good moral person in order to be saved. The creator of this universe and everything in it says repeatedly in his writings, there is only one who can save us from our sin. And that one will be recognized by fulfilling specific prophecies that cannot be faked, specific prophecies that cannot be set up, the Savior must fulfill all the prophecies. There is only one who can fulfill them. Try as hard as they might, only one can do it. If he only fulfills two or three, or if he only fulfills half of them, he is not able to save you and he should not be trusted. So we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden, verse 15. The first prophecy that the Lord gave to Eve was one of the most important. He told her that the promised Savior would be her offspring, offspring of a woman. He did not say their offspring, referring to both man and woman. The Savior would be her offspring only, a woman's offspring. So we see here the Savior is going to be human, but not normal. Ever since creation, all children born in the world were sons of Adam, belonging to Adam's bloodline. And because they were sons of Adam, they had Adam's nature, his sin nature. But notice right from the beginning, the Savior is not of the line of Adam. He's of Eve, of the woman. The sin nature is passed on through the man. So, yeah... We have to take the responsibility, guys, <laughs> for passing it on. Notice right from the beginning, the Savior is not a religion. He's a person. That's important for us to keep in mind because all over we have religion saying this is the way. The Bible repeatedly says he is the way. It's a person. And as we go through this, Note that you are not that person. You cannot save yourself. You cannot fulfill these prophecies. You cannot be the savior. Your efforts are not accepted. So, so far in our study in the Old Testament, we have already seen quite a few prophetic descriptions of what the savior would be like. The promised savior would be the offspring of the woman only, the Savior would be a male. He would be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, meaning he would be an Israelite, a Jew. He would be from the tribe of Judah among the Israelites. 
and more specifically, he would be a descendant of King David. And as we read through the genealogies of Jesus Christ, we see that he fits the bill. But as we get near the end of the Old Testament, we see hundreds of prophecies beginning to pile up. God is speaking more and more and more about the coming Messiah as the Savior came to be known as. The Savior was going to be known as the Messiah. Today we're going to look at what some of these prophets were saying. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, some of these I'm going to give you references and I'm going to go quickly through. Others, uh, we will take time and, and read through them. But Isaiah 7, 14, this prophecy was given about 700 years before Christ. And the prophet said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. So he was going to be a God-man. This is what they meant by he would be the offspring of the woman and not of the man. He was going to be born of a virgin. And he would be called the son of God. His name would be Emmanuel, God with us. This is a mystery that wasn't explained until 700 years later when the angel Gabriel was sent by God to talk to Mary. If you want to look to Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. The Bible says, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin there we have it to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David the virgin's name was Mary verse 29 but when she saw him she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was then the angel said to her do not be afraid Mary for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. The word Jesus means the Lord is salvation. So God with man, Emmanuel, will be the Savior, the Lord. The Lord is salvation. The Lord is the Savior. God with man, the pieces are starting to come together, is going to be God, somehow born through a virgin. Verse 32, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, Son of God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David a descendant of David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, a descendant of Israel, and of his kingdom there will be no end. At his crucifixion, Jesus was identified for all to see with a placard over his head that said, King of the Jews. His kingdom, he declared, was a spiritual kingdom, but after his re resurrection, he promised to return and rule in Jerusalem as King of kings and Lord of lords. And then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. We'll just look at Micah chapter 5. Um, again, about 700 years before Christ, the prophet Micah said, But you, Bethlehem, Epaphrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. So the one who's going to save us from our sins is going to be born of a virgin. That eliminates a lot of people. Born of a virgin. And he's going to be the son of God. Born through a virgin. 
and is going to be from Bethlehem. Out of Bethlehem shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. 400 years before Christ, the prophet Malachi prophesied that a special messenger would precede the Savior to prepare the way and introduce the Savior. And this messenger... Um, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Isaiah 40, verse 3, uh, says that the voice of this messenger would be one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in this desert a highway for our God. And Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9 it says, you who bring good tidings, this messenger that's preceding the Savior, lift up your voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. This is prophesying John the Baptist who came immediately before Jesus Christ, proclaiming, preaching in the wilderness, crying out to the, the people of the cities, behold the Lord your God. We read that in John 1.29. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Remember all the pictures that we saw? The, the Savior would be a sacrificial, uh, come as a sacrificial lamb. His life would be sacrificed in our place. And so John, how does he introduce him? The Lamb of God, God's provision of a sacrificial substitute who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man. Okay, he's the Lamb of God, but he's a man. He's preferred before me, verse 34. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist, fulfilling in detail prophecies that God had given in advance to help us know who is the one who can save us from our sin. Isaiah, again, chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. This is a prophecy of how the Savior would come, what was going to be his, his mission, his ministry when he came. He would preach good tidings to the poor. Jesus came and preached good news to the poor. He has sent me, Isaiah said, to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus healed many brokenhearted. Ones who had lost their sons or children and brought them back and so on. Uh, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Jesus proclaimed freedom from sin and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Jesus freed many from bondage to spiritual possession. Isaiah 9, verse 1 and 2, By the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, in Galilee, the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness, have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Jesus grew up in the district of Galilee, spent most of his ministry in Galilee, where he declared himself to be the light of the world. Isaiah 49, verse 6, It says, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Jesus' ministry uh, extended from the, the Jews beyond them to the Gentiles and his command to his followers was to take the message to the ends of the earth just as the prophet Isaiah had told the one who can save you would do. Another prophet named Zechariah, Zechariah 9.9, 9, 500 B.C., he prophesied, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. So the king would be coming to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you are supposed to respond to his coming with shouts and rejoicing. He is just and having salvation how will you know him? Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus was hailed. Uh, many people came into Jerusalem on donkeys, didn't they? But not many on the colt of a donkey. And as he came, he was hailed 
on his arrival on Palm Sunday as king with shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us. They recognized the signs of the prophets and this is the one he's fulfilling these signs. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. Daniel prophesied about 530 years before Christ. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which was given by um, <laughs> I've forgotten his name. Xerxes. Cyrus? It's different, different names and different. I've, I've got it. I'll come upon it later in my notes here. But <laughs> the, the king to Nebuchadnezzar, or sorry, the king to um, Nehemiah to go and rebuild Jerusalem. From the time that prophecy was, or from that command was given by the king until Messiah the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 50, 62 weeks, or literally uh, it's referring to a time measurement of seven periods of seven and another time measurement of 62 periods of seven uh, for a total time measurement of 483 indefinite periods, but there's going to be 483 periods of time from the command to rebuild Jerusalem and after the, the 62 uh, weeks or the 62 time measurements of seven for a total of 483 Messiah shall be cut off Messiah the Savior shall be put to death and not for himself. He's not going to be put to his death for himself, but for others. It was 483 years after, here it is, King Artaxerxes. After King Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah the command to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that Jesus was crucified. 483. Zechariah 13, verse 7. Prophecy was made, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. My, the Savior who's going to come against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus' followers all scattered and abandoned him when he was arrested and crucified. The following prophecies all describe in perfect detail the experiences of Jesus suffering as he was being beaten and then crucified in our place so that he might save us from our sin. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6. This is prophesying the, what the Savior, what would happen to the Savior I gave my back to those who struck me. Jesus was scourged on his back. His back was whipped by the, the Romans repeatedly. My cheeks, I gave my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. And they plucked out Jesus' beard as they were preparing him for crucifixion. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. They repeatedly smote him on the face and spit upon his face as they were preparing him for crucifixion. Look with me to Psalm chapter 22. Here is a psalm that includes a prophecy of King David in which he is prophesying the crucifixion of Jesus. He made this amazing prophecy about the Savior's crucifixion 600 years before crucifixion had ever even been invented as a form of torture. Psalm 22, verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. This is the Savior. There's no one to help me. He's alone. Many bulls have surrounded me. Now, bulls in, in prophecy are symbols of strength, symbols of power and authority. And in this prophecy seems to be referring to, or certainly would be um, 
fulfilled by the chief priests and the Jewish Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, the Roman leaders, Pilate, Pontius Pilate, and Herod, and their soldiers and officers all surrounding Jesus. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. Strong powers and authorities have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. And Jesus' blood was poured out. They pierced him and water came out. And all my bones are out of joint. Crucifixion dislocates. My heart is like wax and has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws, describing the physical effects of one who is going through crucifixion. You have brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me, the dogs being the Gentiles. And the wicked, they've enclosed me. He was surrounded by the crowds who were mocking him and taunting him on the cross. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. Exactly what happened. His bones were exposed by the scourging that he received. They pierced his hands and his feet. Something that was unknown as a form of torture in the days that David wrote this. They stare at me. They divided his garments. And then his undergarment could not, it was one piece, they couldn't divide it. And so they cast lots for it. Perfectly fulfilling the prophecy. And so here the people of Israel seeing this should have recognized check Check, 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 check. Everything that God said would be a characteristic of the Savior, the one who can save us. Here it's taking place before us as he hangs on the cross. Psalm 59, verse 21, or 69, verse 21. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my first thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Check, check. You can read about it in the crucifixion of Jesus. Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Jesus bore upon himself the sin and the, the punishment, the beating for the whole world. Isaiah 53, look at Isaiah 53, the passage that Sandy read for us this morning. Isaiah 53 and verse 3, he is despised and rejected by men, prophecy fulfilled. Jesus was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Um, beginning with the passing away of his father, his own father, uh, the rejection of his family members, uh, the rejection of the Jews, sorrow and grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, his own disciples fleeing from him, others rejecting him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. That's why he said he was going to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities. He did it for our sin. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. 
yet he opened not his mouth. Repeatedly, we are told that as Jesus went to the cross, he remained silent. He would not answer to his accusers. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison. The night before his crucifixion, he was held imprisoned. And then he was taken from there to judgment, uh, the judgment of the San Sanhedrin first, and then Herod, the judgment of Herod, and the judgment of Pilate. And who will declare his generation? Who are his descendants? He had no descendants, for he was cut off from the land of the living. He was put to death without descendants. These are all characteristics. These are all identification points of what the one who can save you, the only one who can save you, will do, will experience, will be like. They made his grave with the wicked. All who were crucified on the cross were to be buried in a mass grave uh, that was set aside for criminals. But when he died, a rich man talked to Pilate and got permission to bury him in his tomb. So he was buried with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, there was no sin in him. Pilate verified that. The Sanhedrin could find no fault in him. And then Psalm 16. Let's look at Psalm 16. Verse 10 and 11. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol. This is an important prophecy because praise God we do not have a dead Savior. Praise God, he did not leave him on the cross. God raised him from the dead, as King David prophesied here. Psalm 16, verse 10. You will not leave my soul in Sheol. That's the place of the dead. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Another translation says, you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life. Speaking of the, the resurrection, not going to stay in the grave, but you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Prophesying, the resurrection of Christ, that he would not be abandoned to the grave. Now, we've just gone through over 60 specific details that were given. There are 300 plus in the scriptures that Jesus Christ and only Jesus fulfills. God has declared that there is only one who can save us from our sins. God gave many prophecies to make sure that we would not embrace the wrong one, that we would recognize the right one then when he came. Jesus Christ, is he the right one? He fulfills all of these prophecies. Many of them are prophecies that were made long before he came about how he would be born, where he would be born, how he would be put to death, what people would do in response as they were watching him, things that no man could have control over, no one could orchestrate. It was impossible for any imposter to duplicate. The Savior is not a religion. He is a man, Jesus Christ. He is not a religion like Catholicism or like Islam or Mormonism. The Savior is a person. No organized religion can save you. Only the Savior can save you. Many try and make an organized religion out of following the Savior and they call it Christianity. There is a legitimate aspect of Christianity in which you are a follower of the person of Jesus Christ, 
but the more it tries to become organized and institutionalized, uh, and the more it becomes the necessity, the trappings of necessity, it is wrong. The only one who can save you is a man, and he is Jesus Christ. There's only one being in human history who's ever fulfilled these prophecies. We were separated from God by our sin. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. Jesus said that. And he fulfilled the promises. He was drawing their attention to the fact that it's all about me. Our time on earth is a time of testing to see if we will trust God's one way of salvation. Or will we reject his Savior and look for some other, some other religion, some other way, or I'll just try and do it myself. God has said there's only one way. When this life is over, we will live forever with the consequences of our choice, either forever in the presence of our Savior who we trusted and followed, or forever separated from the Savior who we did not trust and refused to follow. Will you choose today to trust Jesus to save you from your sin? Will you choose today to become a follower of Jesus who is the only one who can save you from your sin? And will you take this good news to a world out there that needs to know that it's not a religion, it's not an organization, it is a person who fulfills the promises and fulfills the prophecies. And it is a person who laid down his life as a sacrifice to take away our sin. And he rose again that he might save us, rose again that he might restore us to the Father. Will you trust him? Will you choose to follow him? We invite you this morning to do that. And I encourage those of you who have done that to go out and invite others through this week to trust Jesus, to follow Jesus, who is the only way. Heavenly Father, how can we ever thank you enough that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you for providing a way of escape. Thank you for providing a savior. Thank you that you came, God, as our savior. You so loved us that you gave your life for us. And, oh, Lord, thank you that you rose again from the dead, proving that you were the one. Indeed, you were the one. And you are able to save us from the power of sin because you conquered it yourself. Lord, fill our hearts with faith. And, Lord, I pray that we would not hold this good news to ourselves, but send us in the power of your Holy Spirit, proclaiming to a lost world that Jesus saves Jesus saves. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I do invite you this morning as musicians lead us in closing. Uh, if you would like to receive this Jesus by faith, this salvation from Jesus, uh, maybe you want to know more. Maybe you want to be sure we would be glad to talk further with you. We would be glad to pray with you. Um, there's many in this room. Perhaps you came with someone. You know someone. Ask them. Ask them to help you. Ask them to explain to you more. Uh, I will make myself available. I'll be here at the front. Uh, if you want to talk to me, I'd be glad to talk to you. Lord bless you.